summaries. Let me see if I can pull some up. It's kind of funny. Now I can't log in the 
canvas, because I'm using the wrong user ID, but okay, we're ready to roll. So here's the example that we left off with last time. We'll play around with this example a little bit. We'll summarize it, review it, and then we'll go on to bigger and better things. Don't you love when the number goes up? Of how much longer? Okay, now it's finally going down. Okay, I'm going to do like I said last time. I'm going to extract the zip file. And I will create it in a folder. Uh, called it, By default, it will create it in a folder. You can, of course, eliminate that folder by just creating it on the desktop. And now we have on the folder our forms controls folder. And this is our application folder. All right, remember I talked about like, I keep saying like the application folder, maybe sometimes I'll call it the root folder or something like that. This is where our application lives. And we can tell us where our application lives. First and foremost, it's what has the web config file. All right, and any other file that we created. All right, so I want to go and open this. So I'll go to File. Well, I'll start Visual Studio first, of course. File. Open. Website. We find the folder that the website lives in, and it's on the desktop, and it's called Form Controls. And again, the bin folder is in there, so this is the right folder. Depending on how you extract it and how you zipped it and all that, you might have to go down a few directories. If you ever open up your application and go to run it and it gives you some kind of goofy error, one of the first things to check is to make sure that you've opened the, the actual proper folder and not like a folder above it or something like that. So I'll go and open this up and we'll run it. Opens up the little development web server. temperature Fahrenheit to centigrade. We can choose which one we want. We can put in a value. Zero centigrade should be 212 Fahrenheit. Convert temperature. Oh, I'm sorry, 32 Fahrenheit. I was thinking I'd put 100 in. 100 centigrade equals 212. Okay. Um, Fahrenheit to centigrade 212 equals 100, and then finally minus 40, which is our magic number, and we get our little magic number uh, celebration, and this is bigger, and so on. We have validation in here. If they don't put anything in, we get an error message. If they put in something that's non-numeric, we get a different error message. So let's look at the code. I will always view Solution Explorer. I'm surprised that doesn't come up by default, but if it doesn't, you can go up to View and select it. Look at the default page, and we can view that either in Code View or in Design View. 
or split view, which shows us both. Split view is a little bit hard in this environment simply because the, the resolution of the projector isn't that great. So you're only seeing a little bit of each. So if you had a really big monitor, that might be good. But I would tend to either do everything in design or do things in design view or source view. And I don't use split view too much in class because of that reason. As I said before several times, it's good for you to like be able to, to work your way around in both modes because you'll, you'll figure out a way that works best for you, but there's some things that seem to be easier to do in one mode versus the other. What's going to be in the ASPX file is sort of like the initial uh, state of the page. So we can set properties on the page uh, in the properties window. Probably the most obvious case of that is the magic number panel, I'm sorry, which is a panel called magic. And we initially set the value of the visibility for that to, I clicked on the wrong thing. One important thing when you're doing this, make sure you're selecting the right thing. This shows me I'm actually looking at the property of the H1. I want to select the property of the panel. Now, if it's hard to actually click on it, you can select it through the drop down. So that's a nice technique to kind of be able to, to know and do. If we look at that, it shows the visible is false. Visibility is false. So initially, when this page loads, that's not going to be shown. If we hit the condition that triggers this to be shown, then it will be shown. All right? We have a drop down. We have a text box to enter the data in. We have a convert button. And then we have a label for the results. Most of the action on this page happens when you click the button. Uh, that won't necessarily be the only event that you have. But it will be an event uh, that will, you know, in this case is, is where the action happens. So I can click over to the default ASPXCS. The only thing I can do is double click the button. Now notice, we have here code for BTN, con uh, I'm sorry, BTN convert underscore click. That's the code that executes under two conditions. It's important to remember the two conditions. All right? The code will execute number one when the button is click, of course. But number two the server has to be invoked. There has to be a request made to the server. Now, in the case of a button, a button triggers the request to the server. So that's not really an issue here. Every time we click on the submit button, we've clicked on the button and the request is made to the server. All right? Um, I suppose I could change that by going into the properties for this button and saying... That is not a submit button. That's just a plain old button. In which case, I could click that button all I wanted to, and nothing's going to happen. Almost nothing would happen. I lied. Let's run this and see the HTML that gets generated. Oh, this is dumb. It does make it a regular button, but it gives it a non-click property to go ahead and submit the form anyhow. So that's kind of dumb. I could probably go in to the source code, though, and make it not act like a submit button by getting in. I don't know what it's doing. I'm not sure why you'd ever set that to false, given the way that it behaves. So when you're watching the tape, when I start talking about that submit button, go, go and get 
get a snack or something and come back five minutes later. So don't worry about what I said there. So never mind. Okay. Notice we, let's review the controls we had here. We have the button that invokes the behavior. We have a drop down, which we've manually set the, the, the possible values for under edit items. Later on in the course, we're going to have a data source where we're going to actually uh, bind this to data that we retrieve from the database. But for right now, we're manually entering these items in. So we can enter in Fahrenheit to centigrade, centigrade to Fahrenheit, and give them both the text that's going to appear in the dropdown and the value that's going to be seen behind the scenes. All right. We have some validation controls that are on the text box. This is a required field validator. At the very least, for a validation control, you have to say what control is validating. In this case, it's a validation control for the TXT Fahrenheit, which probably should be changed, the name changed, because now this now does both conversions, uh, and must enter Fahrenheit temperature. Uh, we should probably change that to just say must enter temperature, because now it does both Fahrenheit and centigrade. We also have a compare validate, which will make sure that that validates um, uh, to, to being a numeric field. Let's go in simply because it's good to give meaningful names, and let's change this to TMT input and TN, TXT input and LBL result. So I'm going to have to go in and change, or oh, we'll say label answer. And I have to change my control to validate here to TXD input. Notice how I can make that change without going back to the graphical view. Although I could go to the graphical view if I wanted to. This is exactly what I mean by, like, I don't think there's any rhyme or reason to how I do it. It's just whatever seems like the easier thing to do, I will do. And it's good to know both of them. And let me go in the code behind and change this to TXT input. And at a TXT input. And change this to LBL answer. I hope I've done this right. Only one way to know. That's right. That's right. That's right. How many values should I test to make sure this is probably correct? There's two equations. There's centigrade to Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit to centigrade. 
I look at my code here, and I see there's two paths the code can take. So at the very least, I better test two. I better test a Fahrenheit to centigrade and centigrade to Fahrenheit. All right, that's like minimal. I would want to test both of the validation issues. So I want to test two cases of bad data. All right, leaving it empty, putting garbage in. So right now we're at four cases. Um, I would want to test negative 40. Negative 40 Fahrenheit to centigrade, negative 40 centigrade to Fahrenheit. So we're up to six, all right? And I would probably say, well, one test of Fahrenheit to centigrade probably isn't enough, so I'll probably test a couple of those. So that would be a couple more. So yeah, I would end up around eight or 10, all right? The idea here, though, is when you're figuring out how much to test, you have the advantage of being a programmer, of being able to actually like see the code and know what conditions exist. All right? And you can see even in a simple case like this, this is a very straightforward, simple program, there's a few different combinations of test items that we'd want to test and we'd want to make sure that need to be tested. All right? Um, you should know what to expect as the results for those eight things and make sure that you get the results. Here's the thing. As you make changes to this program, you would go back, and, and even if you didn't make changes to the core of it, like let's say we added another set of conversions, like Fahrenheit to Kelvin, centigrade to Kelvin. All right? If we added, and then maybe Kelvin to centigrade, uh, Kelvin to Fahrenheit. If we added some conditions, we should still retest the old conditions. That's known as regression testing. So if you make a test plan, you would literally say, I'm going to enter in Fahrenheit to centigrade, I'm going to put in 212 degrees, my, accept, my expected result is no error message, and the result in centigrade should be 100 degrees. If I put in negative 40 and say Fahrenheit to centigrade, it should say centigrade is negative 40, and the magic message should appear. Oh, yeah. And in the first case, no magic message appears. All right? So you literally document what you'd expect to happen and go and test it. That's really important. Uh, most code that I see as, as a teacher isn't, like, wrong in the sense of it's 100% wrong and just absolutely nothing works. All right? Most of the stuff I see that's wrong is that it's wrong under certain circumstances, all right? It's wrong, I mean, it's right if you put valid data in, but it blows up if you put in valid data in. It's right if you do conversion from Fahrenheit to centigrade, but it's wrong if you do centigrade to Fahrenheit or whatever, all right? So be careful to thoroughly test your code to make sure that it works. All right. What if I want to put a validation in here for the drop-down? Right now, a drop-down always has a value on a web page. This might be different than C-sharp desktop development. I haven't done tons of C-sharp desktop development, but a drop-down always has a value. And unless we specify otherwise, the first value on the list is going to be the value of the drop-down when the page initially loads. So Fahrenheit to centigrade is, by default, the value that we're going to see. Now, what's the danger of setting a default to a drop-down? Yes? A person may not want to use that in selection. Yeah, a person might not be paying attention and accept the default without changing it. And there's no validation error, <coughs> you know. If, for example, we were registering students for Lorain County Community College and the default was set to the first state alphabetically, which would be Alabama, I think, all right? We're liable to have some students that, in a, in a hurry to enter in that data, liable to skip right over the state field. Alabama is a valid state, so it's not going to give a validation there, and they're going to register but say that they're from Alabama, all right? What's the problem of not having a default? What if I said, please select state as a value? All right. 
What's the problem not having a default? Well, you're inconveniencing people. Um, how many of you live in Ohio? All right. I'd assume that you all do probably, and, and those of you are, that didn't raise your hand are probably still recovering from the three-day weekend or still getting your mind in gear or whatever. So yeah, a vast majority of people that go to Lorain County Community College live in Ohio. Probably a good percentage of them live in Lorain County. Now, what city do they live in Lorain County? Well, that's probably, there's probably more variants there. There's probably a good number from Lorain, Elyria, Sheffield Lake, whatever. All right? So, if you don't set a default, when there's a logical default, you're inconveniencing people. If you do set a default, when there is not a logical default, you will run the risk of people like not paying attention, getting the default value, uh, you know, without, you know, without really wanting the default value. Now, this is sort of a low pressure situation, right? What's the worst that could happen? You converted the wrong temperature, okay? You could click on it and do it again and resubmit it. So this isn't really that big of a deal. But we should learn how to do it both ways. So remember, the default is going to be the first one on the list. So how would you arrange items in a drop-down list? If you had a choice to arrange items in a drop-down list, how would you do that? <coughs> yes? Alphabetical order. Alphabetically would be a great way to do it. What's another way to do it? There's probably one other good way to do it that I can think of, and and maybe there'd be others, but I sure can't think of anything else. So alphabetically is definitely one. Yes? Would you prompt the user as one of the options? Pardon me? Prompt the user as one of the options. Yeah, you'd have, you'd, you'd, yeah, you, if you didn't want to default, you would have a prompt that says, like, enter state here, or choose your state, or something like that. So yeah, definitely you, you would do something like that. What's another logical way other than alphabetical order? What should be at the top of the list for state where students are registering in Loring, for Loring County Community College? Should it be Alabama or should it be something else? Could be a blank option. Let's say we don't have a blank option. Go ahead. Ohio. Ohio. Right. In other words, you could put it in alphabetical order because that's logical, or you could put it in the order in which you, you know the the according to the percentage of people that choose that option. So yeah, if I was doing a drop down for the state of registration, I wouldn't have it purely in alphabetical order. I would have Ohio and then. I default it to Ohio and then have Alabama, Alaska, and so on. Um, I guess there could be other logical ways too, but I, for the most part it comes down to one of those two. All right, so let's say that we really don't want to waste our users' time, so we want to make sure that they select what type of conversion they want. So we're not going to have a default here. If you have a default value, you can't really validate it, right? Because there's no way for your program to know that they forgot to enter it in, or they deliberately selected the default. So if you don't have a default value, what you're going to have at the top of the list is like a dummy value that says, hey, uh, select the conversion that you want. And if you don't have that, then you can validate it. Because if they select that dummy option, then you display the error message. So let's go into our dropdown, and I'm going to put under edit items, I'm going to add an item, and I'm going to say, please select conversion. And under value, I'm going to put none. Now, it doesn't make sense to have that the last item on the list, right? Because no one's going to scroll through a drop down and pick the dummy item at the bottom. The whole idea of the dummy item is that it's going to be topped on the list, top of the list. So I'm going to use the up arrow to put it at the top of the list. So now it says please select conversion. Now we can add a validator. So I can go in here 
and I can say I want a required validator and I'm going to set the class for this to be error. I'm going to say the control I want to validate is the drop down. The error message is please select conversion and initial value has to be the initial value the value that represents the dummy item. And in our case, I put nothing there, so I'll leave that blank. All right? So that initial value has to match what I put in for the value of the dummy item. So now if I go and run this, please select conversion, 11, in there, a single blank space, and then on my validator, I'm going to put it as initial value of space. Let's see if that matters. There it goes. And I get both of those messages. So how many test cases did we add by doing that? We have the eight that we had before, let's say. Eight or ten that we had before. How many did we add for this? I would say we added two more. We'd want to test what happens if they did not choose a selection and they did not put in a value. And what happens if they didn't chose, choose a selection and they did put in a value. Actually, maybe it's three. What if they didn't put in a value? What if they didn't choose a, uh, a conversion and they entered garbage in? So that's a third option. So see how making a small change can, can make for uh, big testing implications. And that's on top of all the test cases we had before. So I should still go in and test this. If I put in a value and put in a temperature, that that test still works the way that it did. Again, that's known as regression testing. And one of the, the things that I've heard a million times as a software developer is I've heard people say something to the effect of, all I changed was one line of code. It couldn't have possibly have broken. All right? Anytime I hear that, I put my hand to my face and shake my head and maybe get a cool beverage or something like that because that's like the programmer kiss of death, all right? How interconnected these programs are. Again, we're talking simple programs here. We aren't even talking about anything advanced. When you get into advanced programs, there's all kinds of interconnections that may or may not impact each other. Well, we're in programs, you should be able to change something here and it won't affect anything over there. But... Not all programs written are well-written programs. So it's very there's definitely a possibility that you make a change in one place that could have an effect somewhere else. It shouldn't, but you don't know until you test it. So one thing I would like to stress in this class, because of all the flaws that I've seen among not just students, but even people that have worked in the field, is that they don't do adequate testing, because they don't really think through what it truly means to test a piece of code. And to be honest, that's why there's, there's still bugs in programs, like Word might explode on you, all right? And it might be almost impossible to figure out under which scenario Word is going to blow up. It might be when you're running X number of other programs and you're low on memory and you try to edit a file that's bigger than a certain... There might be all kinds of special conditions that cause an error to happen, and you never know, right? 
that's why it's so difficult to test these because there's all kinds of things that come into play. Any questions about this section so far? All right. What I'd like to do now is, is, is we're going to talk about a, a program We're going to talk about a program that plays a simple game. All right. I was I, I looked this up online, like under kids' games, because I wanted a game where the rules were really easy and we could we could write the code for it and so on. This this is a game that you play with two dice. All right, and it's called High Love. All right, you take two dice and you roll them. Before you roll them, though, <laughs> all right, I'm getting a little out of order. Before you roll them, though, you guess whether it's going to be low, seven, or high. So a dice can, two dice can have a value of two through twelve, right? Two ones would be a two, two sixes would be a twelve. If you pick low, if the value of the two dice is two to six, you win and you win as much as you bet, all right? If you pick high, if the value is 8 through 12, you win, and you win as much as you bet. So let's say you're playing with points, and you bet one point, and say low, and a 6 comes up, you win one point. So if you're at 100, you go up to 101. If you picked high and a 11 came up, you'd also win. So you'd win one point. So you'd go up to 101. Now with 7, you win 4 to 1. So if I pick that it's going to be a 7 and I get a 7, you win 4 to 1. Now, are the odds stacked for you or against you in this game? The odds are stacked against you. You know, if, if anyone ever asks you that about any sort of gambling game, the odds are stacked against you, all right? Because it's like this. Not to spend a lot of time discussing probability, but there are 36 possibilities when you roll two dice. All right? Six of them... roll a seven. Right? With two dice. Because you could have a one and a six, a two and a five, a three and a four, five, a three. Alright? So six of the six of the possibilities are six of the possibilities are for a seven. Fifteen of them are for luck. So fifteen of them are from two to six. And fifteen of them are from, are high. So from eight through twelve. So, the odds of winning, if you pick seven, are six out of thirty-six. Or one out of six. And they're paying you four to one. So for it to be a fair game, they'd pay you six to one. All right, but they're only paying you four to one. Now your odds are for low are 15 out of 16. 15 out of 36, I mean. So 15 out of 36 is what? I don't know. It's some fraction. It's a fraction less than one half, though, right? And they're paying you even money. So they should be paying you 36 over 15, whatever that works out to be. Divide both, that would be 12 over 5. They should be paying you like 1.2 to 1 for, the, for this to be fair. But they're paying you 1 to 1. All right? So I don't know why I talked about this. This is a probability class. But it is interesting. I will say... I will say why this is important. 
Why do you think this is important even for a programmer to know, even if you're not a statistician or a probability person? Why is this important to know? Yes? So uh, you can have an idea of how it should... Uh... Exactly. So you have an idea of how it should work. All right? In other words, if you write your code, and every time you play it, you end up winning, you know, hand over fist, and you double your points every single time, then... You can do it. I've done this. I've done this in the cases of programs where I wrote that involved probability. Is you could actually write a simulator to play this game a hundred thousand times, right? You could easily, if you write a class, which we'll talk about later on. But if you write a class to play this game, and you randomly choose, and you gather statistics about it. If you ran this 100,000 times, you should get very close to those percentages. And if you don't, one-sixth of the time it should come out sevens. All right? Uh, one, uh, um, 15, 36 of the time it should come out low. 15, 36 it should come out high. If you're getting numbers that are much different than that, if you ran it 100,000 times, you might have a bug in your program. Your program might be playing with loaded dice. All right? So, it is good when you have probabilities involved to have an idea. So, that helps you with testing, right? Because if you have probabilities involved, it's kind of difficult to tell if it works, right? Because there is, there's a randomness involved. But if you ran a whole bunch of simulations and kept track of it, if you found, for example, even if you did 20 rolls, and you got sevens 15 of the times, there's probably a bug in your program. There might be that one fluke, so maybe try it again, but if it consistently got something that was way out of line with the probabilities, uh, chances are there's a bug in your code. So that might be part of my test plan there, to take my object, write a simulator to play this game X number of times. All right. Here's what I like to do whenever I write a new program. And I do this now, probably I did it with the first program that I wrote, all right? Is to take a mental inventory of what you need to do in the program, all right? Then think about what parts of the program do you know, all right? What are, what are the things that, yeah, I know how to do that. All right, or yeah, we we did that in class. All right, and what parts you don't know? What parts that we haven't done anything in class? Then, for the things that we haven't done in class, ask yourself: Have we done anything similar to that? All right, have we done anything similar to that? And then go ahead and start writing. Now, the important thing to remember is you don't have to write everything in one fell swoop. You don't have to write the program from beginning to end and run it and it works perfectly the first time. You can do the program incrementally. So, for example, you could hard code your choice as always being seven and then run it and make sure that's working. Then you can add a drop-down where the user actually gets to pick what their choice is. So you don't have to do everything all at once. You can develop it incrementally and do a piece of the functionality, get that working, and then add another piece and add another piece. All right? Okay. So let's take that mental inventory of what is in this program and what we know and what we don't want to do. What, what we don't know. Almost before that, we're going to sketch the way this program should act. Now, this is where you might accuse me of being hypocritical or talking out of both sides of my mouth. I'm going to write a very bare bones sketch on, on, the, on the screen. And my code is going to be very bare bones. I'm not going to make a beautiful web page. 
That's simply because me and the lecture here, you know, it's not really the best use of my time to review CSS and review all that. So I might make some effort to make it look good, but the focus in the lecture is going to be on the coding. So I still want you to go through and make your pages look good, all right, even if my examples may skimp a little bit on it, simply because we might talk about that a little bit, but that's sort of up to you to do on your own. So anyhow, here's how I would vision the program to work. I would think that we would have a drop down that has four selections in it. Let me define 
define what I mean by no, all right? Because I don't expect you to be experts with any of the stuff yet, right? Because we're just starting out here. But by no, I mean have we at least seen it before in class, okay? So maybe you're a little bit fuzzy on it. This will give us a chance to review it, but we've at least recognized that we've seen it. Have we seen how to make a drop-down? Yes. Have we seen how to validate a drop-down? Yes. Have we seen a button? Yes. Have we seen how to put a value in a label? Yes. So the initial page, we're in good shape for it. All right. Have we seen how to invoke code when we click a button? Yes. Have we seen an example of randomizing something? That is, Essentially what we're doing by rolling the dice is we're going to give, we're going to assign each of them a value from one to six. And we're going to do that randomly. Have we seen an example of that in this class? Not in this class. All right, maybe you've seen it in C Sharp or Advanced C Sharp or something like that. So I'll put a question mark next to this one. Displaying the dice. Have we seen a way to dynamically display an image, right? Because this image isn't always going to be the six dice. This image might be this one dice, the two dice, the five dice, whatever. So we haven't seen a way to do that. We have, however, seen a way to take something on the page and change something about the way it looks. All right? So we put an image on a page, all right? And we've also changed properties of other stuff. We've made a panel appear and disappear. We have changed the value of a label. All right? We've changed the class of a label. So, what we should be thinking about, and I know it, it takes time to get there, is no, we have not dynamically displayed an image. But, have we created an image on a page? Yes. Have we, through our code, changed properties of a control? Yes, we have. So, displaying an image dynamically that's sort of like displaying an image and then dynamically saying, well, what that image is. One time it's the image for dice one. One time it's the image for dice two, and so on. So, even though we haven't done it, believe it or not, we've done things like it. So, that should give us a little bit of comfort. And we can, we can then draw upon our experience and say, okay, I haven't done this, but I made a panel disappear. All right? How much different is making a panel disappear from changing an image? Well, it's different, all right? It's not the same, but in principle, it's pretty similar. You got a thing on the page, you're changing something about it. All right, see if one are lost. We haven't done this specifically, but we've written if statements before. Display the results. All right, we've been able to display messages. We haven't updated a total, but we'll worry about that maybe later on. That's something we really haven't really done anything with, but we kind of have. We've done math and all that. And finally, show the dice. I sort of jumped the gun and talked about that up here. So actually, we're not in too bad a shape. So what I'm going to do for the rest of this class, we'll start off and we'll, we'll get so far today, we might finish it uh, next time, or maybe we'll finish it today. I'm not sure is let's write the code for this guy. So I have some, I have some die out there. All right. Let me pop to canvas. I guess I could take it.
just going to take the image folder from this example. So I'm going to create a new website. I'm going to start off with it being an empty website. File, new, project, it's going to be web, and I'm not interested in any of the newfangled things. I want to do something from the ground up, so I'm going to create an, uh, an ASP.NET empty website. I'm going to put it on the, on the desktop, and I'm going to call it Hilo. I low game. All right, is thinking about it. Here it is. Oh, I'm sorry. Here it is. There's our web config. Bim. I'm going to move in there the images that I had before. Notice what the images consist of. It consists of six images labeled D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, and D6. You see a pattern there. All right. Each one of them is named D plus the value of the dice. Why do you think that might be better than if I called them something like uh, x.png, y.png, q.png, z.png, and so on? Why does D1 through D6 make for better names for this? Yes? Uh, well, for what you know exactly what value you're calling by, the, by, by whatever D and whatever number it's coming mm -hmm. by, it's exactly. also easier to change to. Yeah. It's just, I mean, for one thing, it's logical, right? I never have to wonder, like, was X the 2 or the 5, you know? And it's logical. And secondly, if I think about my program, the image that I want is going to be the letter D plus whatever the value of the dice is. So I roll a 2, I can easily piece together the name of the image by saying the name of the image is images slash D plus the name of the value plus dot png. So I can concatenate the value of the dice with some other stuff and get the name of the image. So I don't have to have like six if statements that says if the value of the dice is one, then choose x dot png. If the value of the dice is two, then choose z dot png or something crazy like that. Okay, so I'm going to go here and I drug that folder over. I want to hit refresh to make it available. So now, did I drag that folder over? I did. All right. I drug it over. There we go. And now I hit refresh, and it shows me that folder. That's important to do if you, if you like, bring something in your application. If you drag it over. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a page. New file. I'm going to create a web form. Default.aspx, good a name as any. I want my code in a separate file, and I want my code to be visual, visual C sharp, so I keep those at the default. I click Add. And away we go. So now I have this. All right.
So now, I can decide what part of this I want to do before we call it quits today. Because I don't think I can get everything in. But, if I think like in terms of doing a piece of the code now, all right, then I can get at least a piece of it working. All right? And I can leave today and I can be happy that I got a part of it working and then we, when we come back on Thursday, we could finish it up. If you try to do everything all at once, if I try to rush and get this done in the next 11 minutes, chances are I probably wouldn't get it to work. And chances are maybe nothing would work. I'd have a bunch of half-started things that didn't do what they were supposed to. I would rather leave the end of the day with something working. Maybe I only attempted a couple things, but they're working as opposed to attempting a whole bunch of things and none of them work. So I'm just going to try to roll the dice today within the next 11 minutes. All right? In fact, I may make it real easy on myself. I'm just going to roll one of the dice. All right? If I figure out how to roll one dice, I should be able to figure out how to roll the second one. So I'm going to try to roll just one dice. All right. So I'm going to go and I'm going to put on my page a button and an image. This button, I'm going to change the name to be BTN play. I'm going to change the text on it to play. And I'm going to change the image to IMG dice one. And I'm not going to put in the image URL for it yet. Because when this game first starts, I haven't rolled the dice yet. So nothing appears. All right? So I'm going to do this piece at a time. Double click that. So I have an on-click method. Notice if we look at the code, it says on-click equals btn button play click. It's not enough to simply have a method called btn play click. It has to be associated with the control via that on-click event. All right. Every once in a while, by, because someone takes sort of a, a, a different route to get there, they end up having a function called button click but it's not related to the control. So they click that button and nothing happens. Well, I'm not going to be very ambitious in my very first pass. I am just going to dynamically set, I'm going to set the value of that image's URL to a hard-coded value. I'm going to set it to a 1. All right? Now you might think, gee, that's not much of an accomplishment. Uh, we could have, we could have, put it in there. But I'm through my code, I'm setting the value of that image. My next step will be to write code to randomly roll it and set it to the image. So how do we do that? How do we set the value of a image control? Well, another way to ask that question is what is the name of the property we're going to use? So image dice one dot and if we look through the list of these, there is an image URL property. And if we hover over it, it says gets or sets the URL that provides a path to the image to display in the image control. So this is the file name of the image that we want to use. I'm going to hard code it to, where's the file? It's in a folder called images. What's the name of the file? D1.jpg. All right. Not earth shattering, right? 
It certainly doesn't actually do what it's supposed to quite yet, but we're getting in a position where it will do that. So, if I get called into the boss's office right now, I have a piece of code that does something. <laughs> it's not what it's supposed to do. It's not the full job yet. But I'm not going to have a mess of 10 things that I started and none of them completed. So I go and run this. The page starts out with nothing. I click the play button and I get an error. All right, interesting. Let me view the source. Images d1.jpg. Ah, do we see the answer? Maybe not if you don't have good eyesight. They're PNG files, not JPEG. Now, let's imagine. I wish I was smart enough to have made that mistake on purpose. But I didn't. I just typed in JPEG because a lot of images are JPEGs, right? However, could you imagine if I wrote a whole gigantic section of code that rolled both of the dices, both of the dies, checked to see, displayed both the images and all that, and I got a broken image. I would be looking at What's wrong with this line, you know, what's, what's wrong with these 20 lines of code? Here, what am I looking at? What's wrong with that one line of code, right? Well, a lot easier to find if, if there's only one line than if there's 20 lines. In a case like this, the problem was very easy to find. If I had a bunch of other code in here, there's a good chance I would overlook the error longer. So now, I go and I say, ah, okay, that's a PNG. Let's try it again and see if it works. And lo and behold, it does work. All right. So now, int value 1 equals 2. Oh, it can cat make that. So I'm going to take images slash D plus the value of value one should be not value two plus PNG. Still hard-coded, right? Still not doing it right, but I'm making progress in that direction. That I have a variable that's now called value 1, which corresponds to the value of the dice. And guess what? If I set that value correctly, it's going to set my image correctly. So I go and run this, and I click play, and it rolls 2. Now I'm always going to roll a 2, right? But I could go back set it to a 6, and that works too. So now I have one thing I have to do. Alright? Remember what our inventory coming into this was. We didn't know how to set the property of an image, but we recognized that, hey, we set the properties of other things. So this shouldn't be that much different. We're just setting a different property of a different control. The only thing we really have left to do is figure out is the one thing that we've never done anything at all like, and that is to randomly set a variable. So at this point, Google becomes our friend. C sharp generate random integer. How do I generate a random int number in C sharp? Okay. I don't know if 
you can read this. The random class is used to generate random numbers, and you do it this way. Random RND, that's your variable name, equals new random. I can then set a month. This is setting a month randomly between 1 and 12. RND next, 1, 13. Well, that's kind of interesting, right? You'd think it might be 12. Well, it's like non-inclusive. It starts with 1 and up to 12. So I'll go and I'll copy this code. I want to generate 1 through 6, so I put in 1 through 7. If you have an issue with that, write Bill Gates. All right? I didn't make that up. I'm just telling you how it works. So by taking it, starting off with what I knew how to do, exactly I knew how to do it. I knew how to create a form with a button and code behind for the button. I sort of knew how to set the value of the property of an image. Kind of. I did something like that before. And then looking up the one thing that I had no clue about, I could piece together one little bitty piece of functionality uh, relatively painlessly. So now when I go and run this, play, three, five, three, five, four, six, And you'd want to make sure, for example, that it didn't always roll a 3. You'd want to make sure that it rolled 1 through 6. You'd want to make sure that at some point it didn't give you a broken image because it rolled a 23 or something like that. It is harder to test random stuff, all right, simply because you don't have as much control. But I could still do some testing. If, for example, by mistake I typed in 1 through 6 here, If I did this often enough, I'm noticing that I'm never rolling a 6, no matter what. Or if I said, by mistake, thinking, well, the total is 1 through 12, but not for one dice. And I ran this, and I got a, a broken image. All right. Well, that would be helpful in testing. So now, we definitely haven't finished this, right? But we have one piece of functionality, and we kind of even tested it, to roll one dice and to display the image. All right? So how hard do you think it is going to do this for a second dice? Probably not that hard. All right? It's going to be almost exactly the same. Then all we're left with is evaluating whether they won or lost, putting the drop down on there. Again, we can systematically take it one step at a time and get to the goal, rather than trying to write the whole thing all at once. Okay, any questions about this? I will go and unlock the door to the lab, then I'll come back, grab my files, and I'll be back over in lab.